Jan Don Castle University, and he's going to talk about the start from the Sudan Delta. Okay, thank you, and I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak at the Institute. Uh, so, the topic of my talk is, as I know mentioned, the Strauss conjecture on black holes. So, let me tell you before what the Strauss conjecture is. Let's say you have some manifold M with a Lorentzian metric G. You can, of course, associate to it the usual D'Alembertian box of G equals to 1 over square root of minus G D alpha of G alpha beta square root of minus G D beta. And let's say you're looking at a semilinear problem that looks like this. So let's say box G of U equals to FP of U with some initial data. So since this is Lorentzian, in order for this to be well posed, I'm going to say that initially U is U naught and K tilde U, well, not U naught. Let me call it F to be consistent with my notes. K tilde of U equals to G, where sigma is some space-like hypersurface, and this k tilde is some sort of time-like uh, vector field. So usually you take, uh, yeah? So is that a that yeah. Uh, n well, so what I'm going to be interested in is uh, the Strauss conjecture on Schwarzschild and Kerr. So there will be, there will be singularities. But we're going to talk about what happens. Yeah, for the time being, let's say. Yeah. So generally, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, I have two Gs. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're right. Oh, uh, yeah. F0, F1. F0, F1, sure. Yes. Yeah, this is, might be a source of confusion with my notes, because <laughs> now I'll have another G there, but I hope it's okay. So usually this K tilde is just the DT vector field. However, we're going to see a bit later that in the case of black holes, this DT vector field becomes null or space-like. So in order for this to be well-posed, you need a time-like vector field. Okay, so what we're going to assume, so what sort of nonlinearity we're going to have here we're going to have fp to be approximately absolute value of u to the power p. So when I mean approximately, I mean up to two derivatives. OK, it doesn't matter if it's a plus or a minus, because we're only going to think about what happens for small initial data. So small initial data would be, uh, so initially at least, f0, f1 were considered to be smooth, compactly supported, and small. So the question is, when do we have global existence for something like this? So, this is the Strauss conjecture, basically. And uh, for okay, for what values? Uh, for what values of p? Does star have, let's call this star, a global solution for all this initial data? So when you say absolute value, you're, uh, you mean, so you could have a singularity, right? 
right, right. But it turns out that P, P has to be, so the short answer is that P is going to be so that up to two derivatives you don't have a singularity. So uh, let, me, let me tell you first. Yeah. The origin, yeah, yeah, right. No, you, one needs to worry about the origin, yes. And this is in dimension two? This is in any dimension. Yeah, this is any dimension. So in Minkowski, Yeah, of course. Why should you only use the variable? Oh, you shouldn't. The expression rather than, for example, the vector for Martin, so you can Yes, you, 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 can, you, can mo you can most certainly look at those also. This is just an example. So the wave equation is not so, well, at least until recently, it wasn't so very well understood, even the linear wave equation for, for black hole backgrounds. So this is a continuation of, I did some of this work on my PhD thesis, and this is in some sense a continuation of seeing how one can apply those techniques to solve nonlinear problems on black hole backgrounds. So let me start with the Minkowski background. So Even if f is equal to zero, it's not, it's just, it's just yeah. non-trivial yeah. things yeah. going on, right? Right, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> so for uh, the Minkowski space-time, uh, the interesting answer to this is that and this is known as the, I guess, the Strauss conjecture on Minkowski, was that you have global existence exactly when, so you need P is strictly bigger than PC, where PC solves a quadratic equation, n minus 1, PC squared minus n plus 1, PC minus 2, equals to zero. So this is what happens in Minkowski. It's and this kind of the, strange, the yeah, n is the dimension. So I guess mg should be one plus n dimensional. Yeah. Well, yeah. So in particular, no, p should be large because the initial data is small. Okay, so the but answer is that, that, point, right? that yeah, 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 mm -hmm. that's right. It's like it's a, it's a local question, basically, it has to do with what's happening near the order. That's right, yeah. So this, this gives you this interesting numerology for n equals to 3, which are the space times of most physical interest. This PC is 1 plus square root of 2. And maybe let me also say that for n equals to 4, I won't say too much about this, but for n equals to 4, this is the most normal looking PC equals to 2. Okay. So, so n is the space time dimension? n is just the space dimension. The space n plus 1 is the space time dimension. Okay. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so let me give some uh, background, some literature. So, the study of this equation was started by Fritz John in 79, and he settled down the case n equals to 3 in both directions. He proved that for p bigger than this, then you have global existence. And for p smaller than this, you have blow up. And then Glassy in 81 was able to prove the n equals to 2 case. Then Zhu in 94 prove the n equals to 4 case. So here n equals to 10 equals to 4, just the global existence result. But uh, uh, it's true in all dimensions that if you have, if your p is less than pc, you do have blow up. And then in 96, my collaborators, Limblad and Sog, uh, proved this for n between 3 and 8, or for all n's, if you have radial initial data, and then with Georgiev in the next year, I believe,
this was in 97, they were able to settle it fully. And let me also mention maybe the work of Totaru in 2001 also settled the conjecture in the full with some different approach using the hyperbolic space-time, translating Strickard's estimates from the hyperbolic space-time into weighted Strickard estimates into the Minkowski space-time. Now, if I write down the Hamiltonian for this, which, I mean, the energy description, right? Okay. So then, then this absolute value, I guess, has the wrong sign. Uh, it, turns out, it turns out that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the sign because, because it's a small... It's a small data existence, yes. Sign does not matter. No. So the, 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 the blow up comes from the singularity of the origin, is that right? I mean, do I understand this correctly? Uh, because otherwise it's smooth, right? Yeah, I, I would, I would think so. I am I correct in, in saying if f of t was smooth and I had absolute large, large behavior was given by that, then I would have global resolution for, for, for all those I'm trying to understand what mm -hmm. the issue is, how, how the blow-up actually occurs. So I didn't, quite frankly, I didn't think about so much about the blow-up since I was yeah, yeah. more concerned about the global existence. Yeah. But uh, you can look, for example, in uh, Chris Sock's book yes. on nonlinear equations. Yeah. He has the, the model that John employed. But if I remember correctly, I, I don't think it's an issue of the smoothness so much. You don't think so? No, I don't think so. Okay, so you're asking why this is relevant for a physical problem? I will admit that I don't think it's so re relevant for a physical problem. Uh, for example, nonlinearities like this do not appear in Einstein's equations here. But the motivation was mostly based on uh, nonlinear wave problems. This was a nonlinear wave problem that has been around for a while. A lot of people have worked on it, and people are interested in, in understanding for which backgrounds the Strauss conjecture still holds for this exponent. And what we are able to do is to prove that for Schwarzschild and Kurtz molangular momentum, this does hold for that exact same exponent. Okay, so the idea of the proof is is exactly what you think it would be. It's just an iteration procedure. So you need to find some suitable norms so that if you start your, so of course you start your procedure with the linear equation, and if you're looking at the nonlinear equation, then box of uk equals to f of uk minus 1, and uk initially is uh, uk of 0 is f0, dt of uk of 0 equals to f1. Okay, so you just control. So the question is, can you find uh, uniform bounds for these uk's in specific norms? So can we find some norm x so that norm of uk in x is less than or equal to, say, a small constant depending on epsilon if the norm of the initial data is in some other norm is less than or equal to epsilon. Okay, so then this is going to converge to a solution to the equation. So this is, this is the difficult part. The, the difficult part is coming up with these norms x and z so that this is satisfied. Okay, so let me maybe give you an idea of how this looked, how these norms looked in the beginning. So in the, in the work of John and Glassy, the norm of u, this norm would be the norm of t to the power n minus 1 over 2. So this, this is the Japanese bracket, Japanese bracket of 
t minus r to some q that depends on p and I guess the dimension n also u in L time infinity Lx infinity. So this is the norm that Chris John and Glassy used. Uh, this norm mode turns out not, doesn't work in higher dimensions. So Limblad and Sog, the norm they use, was, and this is going to be a lot closer to what you're go we're going to use, is going to be norm of r to the power n plus 1 divided by 2p times u. So it's going to be a weighted Stricker's norm. L, p, q, where again this q depends on p and n. It's some exponent. And then not only did they use Stricker's-like norms, they decomposed everything into polar coordinates, and they used different uh, LP norms for each one of the components. So LT, LR, P, L omega, believe 2n over n minus 1. Okay, uh, here. Yes. So this is LT, LR, LR, LR L omega. So this oh, is the, omega, the, the omega. Omega is the spherical, is the angular coordinate. That's right. So each one of them comes with a different uh, exponent, each one of these norms. So they are mixed mixed norms in each one of the variables. So you have a derivative in the angular uh, mm -hmm. direction. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so what is it? I can't count now. Is there a first derivative or is it a fractional derivative? Oh, I'm sorry. Here, here there's no derivatives. Here are just exponents. So LT to the power P times Q, yes. then LR to the power P, and this L omega to the power 2N divided by N minus 1. There's no derivatives. So it turns out that we are going to use derivatives. So our norms are going to look closer to the following. So in 2010, it was the work of five authors, Kidano, Metcalf, uh, Smith, Sog and Zhu so what they looked instead is they look now not only at the Minkowski space-time but the exterior of a certain obstacle let's say like a ball so they look in the exterior let's say a ball it doesn't necessarily have to be a ball but let's uh, for simplicity, let's say it's a ball, and since if the exterior it, it's the exterior of the ball, it's important that it was also a non-trapping geometry. So that means that no geodesics are going to stay in a compact set for finite time. Okay, so the norm they use was, so let's say your ball is B of 0 R. Let's call this, so let's say that your domain is the complement of this ball of 0 r, and then the norms that they use was, so now they had a bunch of derivatives, alpha less than or equal to 2, of norm of gamma alpha u in L infinity h dot gamma, so there's, there's a bunch of indices appearing here. Okay, maybe, maybe this is not the right board to write this, because it's going to be a fairly long formula. So the norm that they performed the iteration is in was some when alpha less than or equal to 2 of norm of gamma alpha u uh, L infinity h dot gamma plus norm of dt gamma alpha u in L infinity h dot gamma minus 1 plus, so this one is the most important one, a certain weighted Strickert's estimate, r to the power n over 2 minus n plus 1 over p minus gamma times gamma alpha u, LTP, LRP, L omega 2. But this is just in the exterior. So this is in 
r plus cross say the complement of a ball of radius 2r. So in the exterior you have this weight is three cards, uh, three cards norm. And then you have another term in the interior that looks like norm of gamma alpha u LTP LX as gamma of R plus cross uh, R less than X less than 2R, basically. Okay, so it's, a, yeah. Right. That's, that's because I didn't say what it was. Oh. Yeah. So this, these are certain exponents. So gamma is n over 2 minus uh, 2 over p minus 1. And s gamma is exactly the exponent that for, uh, for which uh, you embed in h dot gamma. So by Sobolev, so it's given by n times 1 half minus 1 over s gamma equals to gamma. Little gamma alpha? Capital gamma alpha, what did you say? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And gamma is, uh, is the set of vector fields composed by the translations and the rotations. Yeah, so this, you have here translations and rotations. So once you have these norms and, and floats, you just have to work to sort of the reserve somehow on the... Right. You need to work to... So what you do is, of course, you start with the linear equation. You need to uh, pretend that this is linear, right? right. So uh, this is going to raise you up to the power p. Yeah. And then you need to take the correct norm so that you can now control this by this x norm to maybe some power, but if the power is large enough, then you can absorb it. So then you, you can prove that everything stays bounded in this x norm. Yeah, this is the. Yeah, so I needed to now have to construct uh, the ring function of the Galland Birch yeah. to do this iteration. This was probably a problem that was computed many years ago by using all these. Yeah, that's, that's functions. pretty straightforward. Oh. Uh, Right. Like yeah, there is. Like sure. Sure. So that that would be yeah, that would be something that one can do in in Minkowski. But once we go to Schwarzschild and Kerr, then. Wait, no, no, I think I maybe mean, I understand your expression now. For, for this case, for the Minkowski case, it's, it's, it's straightforward. Sure. But in even the, in, for in, in, in over here, here, it's not straightforward, right? Right. Because I mean, such things were done by Lichnerovitz many years ago for the general Lorentzian manifold. You mean this this problem or no no I mean just to construct some ring functions so that you can convert your equations uh, so you can solve the right the left hand side given the right I see okay I I should ask you for this uh, maybe at the end of the lecture for the because I'm not aware for example for the Schwarzschild metric of a of a ring function I'm not sure that they use the Schwarzschild okay Okay, so in this case, the norm that we're going to use for our initial data is going to be, again, sum from alpha less than or equal to 2. So here it's important that alpha is less than or equal to 2. Note that we cannot put three derivatives, right? That's, we cannot put three derivatives because we are uh, close to 1 plus square root of 2. Yeah. So the norm is z alpha f h dot gamma plus normal z alpha g uh, h dot gamma minus 1, where z is almost the same as gamma, but of course you don't have the dp vector field. Like no time. No time, yeah, sure. No time vector field, exactly. OK, so let me finish this uh, introductory part by saying that Sog and Wang, along the same lines, were able to prove this for 
uh, metrics that were conformal to Dominkowski metric with a conformal factor being radial. So I'm sorry, not delta ij, gij equals to hij delta ij for your, uh, well, I guess for metrics that look like minus dt squared plus Laplace of g or g of zero, yeah? Comparable in what sense? It's like, uh, so this one is kind of a complex transaction. No, no. no. So they're different. Yeah, they're, they're, they're different. different. Yeah, they're different norms. Uh, no. No, they had a slightly different norm that I didn't write down. So it's actually not that you control the uh, initial value uh, for, for general unit value by some new assumption. Oh, I'm I sorry. Okay, maybe we can talk. Okay, so finally, Another result that's going to be of interest to us is the result by Chengbo Wang and Yu in 2011, which is able to prove this not only for a, for a conformal, uh, for a metric conformal to Dominkowski metric, but they are able to prove it for box G equals to dt squared minus, say, uh, Laplace G0, where G0 is asymptotically flat with certain rates of decay towards infinity. Okay, so we don't need to have exactly the Minkowski metric. So this is the exterior of a ball in the Minkowski metric, right? So they are able to get rid of the assumption that towards infinity you are exactly the Minkowski metric. But do they use similar? Yes, they use, they use something very similar to, to this. Right. To solve, uh, the right. The no. No. Right that, that's correct. So you need you need you need, you need no, estimates. Yeah. Much of the machinery uses that, right? Uh, no. No. Not so much. I mean, I much of this machinery uses that. That, that certainly uses it. Yes, but this this does not. So, really, what what gives us is is what I'm going to talk about next, which is local energy estimates. So, local energy you can get local energy estimates without knowing the the Green's function using, so you're trying to use as robust of methods as you can, yep. because then presumably you're trying to apply your methods for hopefully the Einstein equations or very nonlinear methods. That's, uh, that's not always easy, but let me. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Here? Yes. So let me remember. I think it was. They must have, they probably have it going to one at some point. Yeah, it, it goes to one. It goes to one. It goes to one, and the derivative, let me think. Yeah, the derivatives fall off at certain rates, and each derivative falls off at a. I'm sorry. Yeah. G i j meaning. So, okay, so. Oh yeah, no IJ. I'm sorry. And yes. R yes. R, 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 R is the radial yeah, coordinate. No, but it, 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 right, it, but it has to be radial with two metrics. So in, in this paper it does. In this paper it does. In this paper it doesn't. They are able to remove this. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it's perhaps time to Okay, so as I said, the idea is that the, the most important term is this term. So the way. No, yeah, yeah, maybe you can say what that term means. That's a long, that's a long 
Right, so, so it's a... So you, 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 ha you, have, you have up to two derivatives, either, either uh, uh, angular derivatives or, 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 or the usual or derivatives, or time or space derivatives. You have a certain weight, radial which is a radial weight, mm -hmm. and then you have mixed LP, LR, L omega norms. So the way, the way you get such, such an estimate is by interpolation. So if you have a... So, so what estimate are you going to get? This is a definition, right, of the, of the norm. Uh, right. So you need... Right. So what you need to... Uh, so what's going to happen is you need to prove roughly that when you put it in here, and you're going to have something like u to the p now, so you're going to replace, uh, okay, you're going to have another norm that I guess I haven't quite written it down. Uh, so let me see. You can, yeah, you can, for the, for the linear equation, you can bound this term by a term that looks like Again, r to some power that I forget right now, times gamma alpha f. And now you're going to have in L, I believe, L1, L1, L omega 2. And something like this uh, helps because here you have the p power, so the power gets up here. So you get this LP, LP. So this is, this is the idea of why that's, that norm is useful. And the way you get to that norm is by interpolation between something. So let's say you have r to the power, some power, times uh, u in L2, L2, L2. And then maybe r to some other power times u to the power L infinity, L infinity, L2. So you interpolate between this, these two inequalities if you have them. So it turns out that this inequality is, is somewhat uh, more stable. So you can, you can just apply the trace lemma. And you get the following type of inequality. You get something like r to the power n over 2 minus s, l infinity, l infinity, l2. This is bounded by norm of u in h dot of s. You get this type of inequality. This is just the trace lemma. Okay, this one though, this one is where all the game is in some sense, right? This is, this is what I mean by local energy estimates. So if we can bound this by something meaningful and we interpolate, then presumably we're gonna get, you interpolate between these powers of R, of course, you interpolate between L2 and L infinity, and you should get exactly this kind of inequality here with LP, LP, and this is where this exponent is coming from. But that's, that's sort of the origin. Yeah, that's r exactly, yeah. Okay, so now the focus is, is in trying to understand local energy decay. So this sort of decay, this L2, L2 kind of decays are called local energy. L2, L2 means L2 in time. So this, this is L2 in everything, L2 in everything. So which is just the usual L2, L2, L2 in time, L2, full L2, exactly. Okay, so in Minkowski, let me again start with Minkowski. As far as I know, yeah. No, the, L the LP in time are, are global norms. You need to control global norms to get yeah, global existence. Time, so. Yeah, stricter time. Yeah, exactly. Global records in time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so in Minkowski, if you're looking at box u, let's say equals to zero, or okay, box u equals to f and some initial data, u of zero equals to f zero dt, u of zero equals to f one. There is this argument that comes, goes all the way to Morovets. 
that you can multiply this by a suitable A of R DRU and just integrate by parts like crazy. And you end up with something that looks like this. So you can control the usual energy norm on time slices. So norm of nabla t of x u in L infinity L2. So this is just the energy. Plus, and then you have this sort of, you get this sort of uh, local energy norm, which I'm going to write like this. So I believe this is sharp. Supremum over R approximately equal to R of R to the minus 1 half nabla of T of X U in L2, L2. And then plus supremum when R is approximately equal to R of norm of R to the power minus 3 halves U L2, L2. Okay, so this is an L2, L2 norm. The derivative picks on r to the minus 1 half weight. The function u picks on r to the power minus 3 halves weight. Okay, so this is less than or equal to initial data in h dot 1 cross L2. So 0 f1 in h dot 1 cross L2. And then plus some norm related to f. So plus norm of the norm is r to the power 1 half f L2 L2. So by the way, you cannot take the supremum away here. So you cannot, you cannot sum. What you can do, of course, is, so this is a supremum over dyadic region. What you can do is get rid of the supremum if you are willing to put a minus here and there. Okay, so depending on your situation, if you can afford to lose a minus, then you don't need the supremum there. So in what sense is that local? I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't yes, know. it's local in space. Local in space. It's global in time, yeah. If you want to think about it as globally supported function, then you don't need these weights here. And then. It's local in space because you put this R, is it, is it R in there, or that's, that's not? Right, well, yeah, that, that's one way to think about it. And as I said, the other way to think about it is that uh, it's, it's an estimate for local regions. What, what is this capital R? I mean, how do I, I so this is, okay, so R is uh, dyadic. So R is dyadic. R is dyadic, yeah. So supremum over all this dyadic annuli of this guy is, is bounded by your. What do I have? Two to the R, two to the, I mean, two to the N, two to the minus? Two to the, yeah. So R is, so if you want two to the J minus one, less than or equal absolute value of X, less than or equal to two to the J. So it's one to the J. This right hand side is not, does the right hand side depend on R? This right hand side? Mm -hmm. uh, no, it doesn't depend on capital R. No, that's the whole point, yeah. It does not depend on capital R. You can sum, so as I said, if you want to sum all of these guys, you need to lose, you need to lose a little bit here. So then you have to get something on the right hand side, the R to be some negative R. No, no, because, because it's a geometric sum. Oh, oh yes. Yeah, so you, you don't need to get anything that depends on R here. Pretty much. I mean, you, you have to work a little bit to get the correct, uh, the correct multiplier then. Minkowski's, uh, sorry, not Minkowski, Morovitz's original multiplier was the R of U, actually. But derivative. just derivative. derivative. But if you just take just derivative, you don't get the full, the full thing. You just get the angular derivative. The the, the yeah, you just get the angular derivative. So you need to be a bit more creative with this multiplier to get the full, the full statement of the theorem. Okay, so so this is what happens in Minkowski. So what about, let me now, I have not said a single thing about black holes. <laughs> so since my title implied them, I should, uh, I should maybe start talking about black holes. So let me talk about Schwarzschild since that one is easier. So the Schwarzschild black hole is the unique spherical symmetric solution, vacuum solution to the Einstein equations. If you want to write its metric down, it looks like minus 1 minus 2m over r dt squared plus 1 minus 2m over r to the negative 1 dr squared plus r squared times d omega squared. d omega squared is the usual metric on the sphere. 
Okay, and if you look at it, you see that there are points when the metric doesn't quite look right. Okay, so one such point is r equals to zero, and one can actually check that at r equals to zero, the metric is indeed singular. One can compute, for example, this r alpha beta gamma delta r alpha beta gamma delta quantity, which is a geometric invariant and which goes like one over r to the six. So that's an actual singularity. What about r equals to 2m? This one looks like a singularity also, right? But it turns out this is only a coordinate singularity. So people took a while to realize this, right? I think from 1916, when this metric was first discovered by Schwarzschild, till 1950-something, I think. I'm sorry? Kraskow. Kraskow, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so indeed one can take the Reggie Wheeler coordinate, which is r squared equals to r plus logarithm of r minus 2m, and then if you take v to be equal to t plus r, r star, if you make this change of coordinates, then your metric is going to look like ds squared equals to, uh, what is it, 2 dv dr plus 1 minus 2m over r dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. Okay, and this one is extendable over r equals to 2m. So this is indeed a coordinate singularity. Okay, and one can do something similar uh, with the w or u equals to t minus r star, and it can still extend it, uh, and you can get another extension. And then there are this, so Kruskal was able to obtain the maximal extension of Schwarzschild, whose Penrose diagram I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw. So let me first draw the Penrose diagram, and then I'll, I'll try to explain what all these things mean. Okay, so this is, this represents the exterior of the black hole. R is bigger than 2m. This here are singularities, r equals to zero, r equals to zero. This here is a black hole, this is a white hole, and this is a twin universe of this one. So this here represents the so-called future null infinity. So this is the place where future null geodesic, future null geodesics go to die. And this similarly is past null infinity. And these things here are the so-called event horizon r equals to 2m. So the interesting thing about these Penrose diagrams is that they are a conformal compactification of your metric. So distances, of course, cannot be preserved because this is a compact region. But it's conformal, right? So what does it mean if it's conformal? It means that it's causally equivalent. Null geodesics go to null geodesics. So I can easily see on this compactification what happens to the null structure, right? So why is this a black hole? Well, because if I start somewhere here, I can only travel within a light cone, so I have to crash into the singularity, no matter where I travel. If I start here, if I'm unlucky enough, I get into the black hole and here I'm doomed, but I can also travel all the way to infinity. Okay, so similarly with the white hole, if you're in the white hole, you have to get out of there, and so on. Okay, so what is the region of interest? So the region of interest is the exterior of the black hole. Okay, so most of what I'm doing is in the exterior, except that you're also interested what happened with the event horizon. So it would be nice if you could have estimates that work beyond the event horizon also. So for now, I don't know of any estimates that, will, that are uniform estimates that go all the way to the singularity, but we have estimates that go all the way to a slice like this, r equals to r e, inside the black hole. Okay, so now I want to pose my, uh, my problem there. 
So I don't want to work in the T and R coordinates because these are my t equals to constant slices. Uh, what I want to is I want my slice to start inside the event horizon a little bit. So I just modified my coordinates a little bit. So I stay with the t coordinate far away from the event horizon. And when I'm near the event horizon, I just get a coordinate that gives me a space like initial hypersurface. So my coordinates looks, my coordinate looks like t tilde equals to t minus some function mu of r that's properly chosen. So this is properly chosen so that it's uh, zero uh, far away from the event horizon, but it looks like, I don't know, minus, I guess minus r star near the event horizon. And then if I choose this function mu properly, then t tilde equals to constant give me a foliation of space-like hypersurfaces. So I can put my initial data on t tilde equals to zero. So my initial data will be t tilde equals to zero all the way to say until it's going to intersect this guy here. So this is where my initial data is going to be. Uh, this? Oh, uh, let's see. Okay, maybe, okay, maybe. You're right, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I drew it, maybe I drew it poorly. Let's, let's say it's like this. So I just, I just take it all the way to some r equals to re. I just take it all the way to some r equals to re, where re is inside the black hole. This I can do. Going down? Uh, I believe we, can, uh, believe we can do that also. But for now, we are just looking at the forward in time with initial data here. So we're looking at the problem forward in time. So this is why I said here that you need k tilde to be time-like. Because here, you cannot take dt, which is the same as dv or the same as d tilde, because this becomes null and space-like. And this is not going to be a well-posed problem. So we need, you need to take something that's dt all the way here, and then here you need to keep it timelike. OK, so uh, let me briefly talk about now about the linear problem. On, on such backgrounds, on the Schwarzschild background. So if you're looking at the linear problem, now box G of U equals to F with some initial data, I would like to obtain an estimate that's similar to this estimate, to this local energy estimate. So I'd like to, if I could, get something like R to the power minus 1 half minus, maybe with the same power, Nabla TXU, L to L2 plus R to the minus 3 halves minus U, L2, L2. So unfortunately, this is not possible. The reason this is not possible is that Schwarzschild geometry has trapping. So it turns out Schwarzschild geometry has two types of trapping. So it has the so-called, it has some trap rays at the event horizon, r equals to 2m. So we can easily see what these are in this, in this Penrose diagram. They are just these null geodesics that stay at r equals to m like that. OK, and then you have, so this turns out to be a bit of a nuisance, but not too bad. In particular, it turns out that the estimates near the event horizon have this exact same form. But you also have the so-called so -called photon sphere at r equals to 3m. So you have the event horizon at 2m. You have the photon sphere at 3m. So at the, at the event horizon, the, the trapped geodesics just stay at one point. They're trying to get out, but they get sucked in. Right? At r equals to 3m, this is not how they look like. They're just tangent. All these trapped geodesics are tangent 
to the r equals to 3m uh, sphere. So the reason the event horizon doesn't give us problem is because of the so-called redshift effect. So what the redshift effect tells you is that when you are here, high frequencies get sucked exponentially fast in some sense into the black hole. Whereas on the photon sphere, you can have, say, wave packets very focused near here that can linger around for a long, long time. So indeed, this is going to give us some losses in our estimate. OK, of course, one needs to quantify all this. And the way you quantify it is, again, you take suitable multipliers here. So you, you again look at this. You multiply it by, again, something that looks like IR, DR, but significantly more complicated than you had before. You integrate by parts. And then what sort of estimates do you obtain? So what you obtain is you obtain losses at r equals to 3m, like this. So you obtain norms that now are degenerate exactly on the trap set. OK? Only on this trap set. It turns out that you don't get any losses because of the redshift effect. You don't get any losses on this trap set. OK? So I should say maybe some of the literature, so the study by using this Morovets type of estimates of the wave equation on Schwarzschild black holes was in initiated by Blue and Sofer and continued by Blue Sturbans, Tafermos Ronjansky. And the estimates in this form are from a paper that I wrote with Jeremy Marzuola, Jason Metcalf, and Daniel Tataru. OK, and in the paper, we continue to actually prove Strickert's estimates also. This requires better estimates like this. So it turns out that with a lot more work, you can replace this loss here by just a logarithmic loss. Average. By just a logarithmic loss, so much stronger statement. Instead of having this polynomial type loss, you only get a logarithmic loss. A logarithmic loss, yeah. And you, need, you actually need that to obtain Strickert's estimates, or at least to obtain the full range. Uh, yeah, if you, write, if you write down the Hamilton flow yeah. and you're trying to find out what the trap geodesics are, yeah. you're going to find that there is a family of trap geodesics. So, so uh, okay, so in order to be trapped, you need to start exactly tangent to it. If you start like this on the photon sphere, you escape. If you start like this, you go into the event horizon. So that's the bottom, that's the boundary. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Photons can just rotate around. They're just big circles rotating around uh, the black hole. Yeah. So fortunately, this is, this is very unstable. This is on a, a hyperbolic trap set. This is why you have any estimates at all. Or like, the, why, this is why you have estimates of the logarithmic glass. Because, of course, by the uncertainty principle, you start a little spread it out. So then you spread out, right? But there's still losses. So here, Yes, that's right. OK, so the theorem. What, what the conclusion is you, you can't do it, or what, what is the conclusion? No, no, you can, you can do it as long as you add some losses of some sort. Okay. So this is one type of losses that you can add. And another type of loss that you can add, if you don't like your ways to degenerate, yeah. and we don't, you can add extra derivatives in your initial data. Okay. That's another way you can do it. So if you don't like the weights there, you can put, for example, more like norm of, let's see, norm of, yeah, norm of F0. Instead of having it in H1, you have it in H2. Yeah. But something needs to give. You cannot have the same type of estimates as there. OK, so I guess the theorem that I wanted to present in joint work with Hans Lindblad Jason Metcalf, uh, Chris Sog, and Cheng Bo Wang is that the Strauss conjecture or maybe let me say global existence holds
for the same range of exponents p bigger than 1 plus square root of 2. And let me also mention that for Schwarzschild, uh, the other way around, it's been settled, I believe, in 2006 by Catania and Georgiev, who proved that you, you have blow up for p less than 1 plus square root of 2. OK, so the idea is to use this, uh, this kind of argument with, the, with this local energy norm. But we, you need to be more clever in choosing, I guess, both the initial data and the type of estimate that you're going to prove here. So what we are choosing is for initial data, for what we are choosing is not just this h dot gamma, but we also need an h dot 1. So this one probably is not sharp. I would say so, sorry, f, f not f1, f not. So here we don't have just h dot gamma, we also have h dot 1. So I need more regularity on my data, plus norm of z alpha f1 uh, h dot uh, gamma, uh, what was it, gamma minus 1 intersect to f2. OK, so there's two reasons why I need more regularity. One reason comes from this sort of estimates that you can see that if you add a bit more regularity, then you can get rid of these degenerate norms. So that's something that you want to do. The second reason is also quite interesting. I don't quite have time to explain it. But near the event horizon, you have this redshift effect, as I said. But the redshift effect helps you mostly for high frequencies. And Let's say you're trying to, to prove, so uh, let's say you're trying to prove something like nabla of tilde x of u in L2 less than or equal to nabla of f naught f1 in h dot 1 cross L2. OK, so this one, this one is definitely true. But what we also like is to have an estimate that inverts this derivative. So an estimate that says norm of u in L2 is less than or equal to norm of f naught f1 in L2 cross h dot minus 1. This one turns out that at least the heuristic, com oh, sorry, this is, this is L infinity L2. L infinity L2. L infinity L2. So this one turns out that it's not true. So this sort of estimate is not true. So if, 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 of course, you have the usual Minkowski unbox you, then it is true. You can just, co say, commute your equation with d to the minus 1. But here, at the event horizon, this stops being true. You cannot do this thing anymore. You don't have an elliptic operator to just sort of invert it with. So this doesn't hold true. So then I guess you need to be more careful in uh, choosing your estimate because remember, uh, I guess okay. Maybe I haven't done a good job explaining this, but you need you also need this sort of estimate, L infinity L two. You need this sort of estimate. It's uh, it's also right. It's also here, L infinity H dot one, right? But if if this gamma and I should have said here that this gamma actually turns out to be less than one half. Less than one half. If p is close enough to one plus square root of two, and these heuristic computations that I did near the event horizon tell you that the borderline is kind of one half, where you expect something like this to happen. So I'm not so sure about one half, but I believe you can prove this. But once you go after one half, I don't think this is true anymore. So you need more regularity here than you already have. So that's why you need this h dot one for these two issues related to trapping. And then, uh, you just need better initial conditions. Yeah, right? you need better initial conditions, right? And we also, and you also need uh, you need to be careful with the norms now. So when you do when you do the iteration, actually it turns out that. So the norms are going to look similar, but uh, in, order, in order to have uh, 
to have the an estimate for the linear equation, a term that appears naturally is something that appears from the Duhamel formula, is something like norm of gamma alpha F L1 L2 L2. This is something that did not appear before. And this is the norm that's actually difficult. This is the technical part. So you need to replace your f by absolute value of u to the power p. So this is sum of alpha less than or equal to 2. And then you, you need to play around. It's not, it's not trivial. It's not that difficult either. But you need to play around a little bit and be able to control this by the things that you already have controlled. And then you are able to, to get it for, for Schwarzschild. And the main difference for the Kerr estimate with angular with a with big ang oh, sorry with small angular momentum is the following. Yeah, we can do Kerr with small angular momentum also. I did not have time to well, I guess I'm fairly close to, to finishing. I didn't have time to say anything about the Kerr geometry. The Kerr geometry, so this, these estimates are very good, except of course near the losses. So near the losses where they're strapping. Now in the curve geometry, you have a trap set that looks very nasty. It's much nastier than this r equals to 3m. So you need to use a similar idea, but multipliers, this vector field doesn't work, this met vector field method doesn't work anymore. What we use is pseudo-differential operators. So we have pseudo-differential operators, and the local energy norm are going to look similar to this, except that you're going to have a pseudo-differential operator whose symbol vanishes exactly on the trap set. So this is where you're going to have your losses. So again, if you trade for more regularity, we can prove that you can get rid of that. You get this, this type of estimate if you are willing to trade more regularity. And I guess the main difference is going to be, uh, I think I still have this here. So near infinity, we can apply this uh, paper of Wang and U almost ad literum when the metric is of this form. But in Kerr, the metric is not going to be of this form. It's going to be a term, it's going to have a term that looks like dt d phi there. So we need to massage, massage it into doing something. So use the methods from this paper, but there's, there's some work to be done there. OK, so I think I'll probably stop here. Thank you. Right. In some family of pseudo differential operators, I don't know, you just use one of the you probably just want some family. Uh, so well, there's some we only use one. The Fermos and Ronieski have a, have a family depending on, on on your frequency, on your angular frequencies. Yeah. yeah. We we can do it with just one. You can do it with just one. With just one. And then you have to integrate by parts to get these estimates. Right, and right. Then you, to, then you have to show that these these are these estimates are sufficient so that you can apply it to card calculations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say probably not, probably not, because the, the nonlinearities that appear in the Einstein equations are not the semilinear nonlinearities. They are more of a null type condition. So I think probably not. I mean, the, the, I guess the, the motivation for this problem ca came talking to Chris Sog, and he really likes the, the Strauss conjecture. So we wanted to see whether we can do the Strauss conjecture on these manifolds that come from general relativity. But I don't think that you can, I, I'm not sure whether these methods apply for the Einstein equations. I'd say probably not. Because the nonlinearity is more, more trivial. Yeah, yeah. Nonlinearity is not a semi-linear type. Strickert's estimates are not, are not enough. Yeah. Right. There was something that I wanted to mention. So I believe our methods also work for n equals to 4. Uh, and for n bigger than equals to 5, I believe this term that I, I mentioned that we need to, did I write it down somewhere? 
yeah, this sort of term, I don't think we can't control it anymore from, uh, from the, I don't think we can close the bootstrap with this term in five or more dimensions. But we are, of course, mainly motivated by the inequality of utility. Uh, you, you need you need the rest shift effect to to obtain this sort of estimates yeah yeah you need this rest shift effect to uh, to obtain estimates here without any loss of the event horizon because there is trapping there it's just that the energy that's trapped there gets sucked exponentially fast into the black hole so this is why you don't have any losses whereas the energy here at the photon sphere tends to linger around this is the, the heuristic method. I mean, you can do, you can look, if you want to, you can look at the Hamilton flow and you can look at, so the Hamilton flow, so this, 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 uh, these geodesics, as I say, they don't move. They just stay at the point. And if you look at the Hamilton flow, the only energy is gonna come from the, so this C is gonna be the, uh, the, vari the variable associated to the, to the R, to R, to the R uh, coordinate. So if you're writing the, Hamiltonian flow, you're gonna get something like this. C dot equals to approximately minus C. So this tells you that this energy associated to C decays exponentially, roughly. So does all this show up in, in the integration by parts? Or how, no, how no, 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 no. This is the heuristics. In the integration by parts, you pick up this vector field cleverly near the event horizon, and that does the trick. You don't, you don't see an exponential decay in the integration by parts argument. But this is, this is a heuristic of why you should not have any losses at the event horizon. Yeah, that's, that's, that's an equivalent way to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, positiv the positivity of the surface gravity is exactly this sign here, right? Th this is how it appears in this, in this Hamilton flow, exactly. So Okay, thank you.